Well, next week we're going to be celebrating Easter, and you know what? I can guarantee you it's going to be a great day here. I mean, we're going to have some incredible decorations. Uh, we'll be celebrating communion. We'll be having an opportunity to hear some great, great music. It's just going to be a great day here. But let me ask you this today, because I don't think that we ever get asked this question. And so here we go. How are you preparing for Easter? I mean, you know, if it was Christmas, it would be really easy, wouldn't it? We could say, well, we, we hang a wreath on the door, we're putting up a tree, we're wrapping presents, but Easter? What, are you going to maybe dye a couple of eggs, pull a ham out of the freezer, go to the store and buy something new to wear? I mean, you know what, when you think about it, it, it almost appears that, well, Easter just isn't on the same plane as Christmas, is it? And I wonder if the reason we struggle with it is be because before we can ever get to a celebration of Easter, we've got to get through this week. And this is a week of growing tension and conflict. You know, I mean, as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, some of the Pharisees were standing there and they were quite literally saying, Teacher, tell your disciples to shut up. Just shut up. We don't want to hear them. This is going to be a week of scheming and backroom deals. And Judas isn't going to be the only person who's, who's going to sell his soul. By Thursday evening, Jesus will be arrested by... Mid-Friday afternoon, he'll be dead. He'll be wrapped in a burial shroud, and his body will be placed in a tomb. You know, were you there when they crucified my Lord just doesn't have the ring to it of hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. And so maybe the question for us then is, how do we prepare for Easter? How do we prepare in the midst of a week of gathering darkness and evil and death? Well, you know, the more I've thought about that, the more it's occurred to me that maybe that's the wrong question to be asking. We really don't need to be asking how do we prepare ourselves, but we really need to be asking how has God been preparing us for Easter? And so we want to think about that for a few minutes this morning because, you see, our scripture passage, I think, highlights three ways that God has already been preparing us for a celebration of the resurrection. So why don't we begin looking at our scripture passage? See, you thought I'd forgotten this, didn't you? I know. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he told them. Now, folks, the first way that, Jesus, that God prepares us for Easter is by calling us to listen to Jesus and do exactly what Jesus tells us to do in our lives. You know, he called these two disciples and he said, I'm going to send you up here into this village. You're going to find a colt that nobody's ever sat on. I want you to untie it and bring it here. If anybody asks you what you're doing, all you need to do is just say the Lord has need of it. Now, do you know these guys were committing a capital crime? Okay. If they had been accused of stealing the wrong colt, that's a capital offense. They're done for. They're over. But you know what? They listened to Jesus. They do exactly what he told them to do. Now, it's kind of like Jesus telling you, now, I want you to go out Wisconsin Avenue here, and when you get out to the Alpine Market, you're going to find this blue SUV parked in the lot. It's going to have the keys in the ignition. 
Okay. Now, I want you to get in, and I want you to bring it back to me. And if anybody comes running out saying, what do you think you're doing? You can just say, oh, the Lord has need of it, and just keep on going. <laughs> okay. But they do. They listen to what Jesus tells them to do. And the results are extraordinary. Let's continue on. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. They had no way of knowing what was going to happen. But Jesus told them what to do, and they listened, and they did it. And the results were extraordinary when they saw the people throwing their coats on the road and Jesus riding over them and the incredible procession that was taking place. And now maybe the question to us is, what is Jesus calling you to do as you prepare for Easter? Is Jesus calling you to forgive someone? Is he calling you to help someone? Is he calling you to perhaps take on something that you've never done before or possibly even give up something that you need to get rid of in your life? Is Jesus calling you to say yes to something or perhaps even no? Folks, I have no idea what Jesus is calling you to do, but he knows and you know, there's probably a pretty good chance we know as well. And what we need to do is listen. It's just like Jesus' mother Mary said at the wedding feast at Cana. Listen to him and do what he tells you to do. And that's really the first step in preparing for Easter, listening to Jesus. Listening to him in Scripture listening to him through prayer, listening to him through the lives of others and then doing what he calls us to do. Now, the second thing that God does in order to prepare us for Easter is he challenges us to have the very heart that Jesus had. We go to the next slide. As he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, tell them to shut up. We don't want to hear it. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Did I miss something? Wait a minute. Hold on a minute. Duh. Okay, all right. Yes, let's continue. <laughs> okay. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. You know, this must have seemed like a very, very strange scene to so many people, because here is Jesus riding into Jerusalem to all of these cheers, all of this shouting, and in the midst of it, we're told he was weeping. But you know, folks, I don't think weeping does justice 
to what Jesus was going through that day. This is really a gut-wrenching sob that he had. It's the very same word that was used to describe Mary as she was weeping at the tomb of her brother Lazarus. It's the same word used to describe Mary Magdalene as she was weeping at the tomb of Jesus. It's the very same word that was used to describe Peter as he was weeping after denying Jesus three times. This is a gut-wrenching sob that Jesus is experiencing at this point in time. And he's not weeping for himself. He's not weeping because the cross is ahead of him. He's weeping for the people of Jerusalem. His heart goes out to them. It's quite literally broken for their sake because he knows He knows that they're lost without Him. Friends, God prepares us to celebrate Easter by challenging us to have the very same heart that Jesus had. By challenging us to be people of compassion and care. He challenges us to to have a broken heart for those who are poor and those who are powerless, to those who are lost, to those who are seeking, to those who are seeking and they haven't the faintest idea what they're even seeking for in life. And the question this week is, who is Jesus calling you to have a broken heart for? Perhaps a husband or a wife, a child, a grandchild, a close friend, a neighbor, a co-worker. Again, I don't know who God has on your heart, but God knows. And you probably know as well. And God is calling us to have a heart of care and compassion for that person. How will you live that out this week? What can you do to make the difference with someone who's lost in their life? And so those are the first two ways that God prepares us for celebrating Easter. He calls us to listen to Jesus and do what Jesus tells us to do. And then he calls us to have the very same heart of care and compassion that Jesus has. And then the third thing that he calls us to do is he calls us to say, to tell what it is that we actually know about Jesus and about Easter. Let's look at the passage from Matthew. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. You know, that word stirred in the Greek is really the root of our word seismic. And it's used once again in the Gospel of Matthew at the very moment when Jesus dies. And so in the 27th chapter in the 51st verse, we read this. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. Folks, Jesus' presence in the world is an earthquake. It quite literally causes a seismic shift in the thinking of this world and the future direction of this world. And Jesus' disciples at this point understand that. And when people say, what's going on? What's happening? They don't hesitate. They say, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Folks, there are people who are waiting and looking to see if God is real. They're looking to see if God really does care. They are people who need a seismic shift in their lives. They need to quite literally experience an earthquake of God happening within them. The only way they're ever going to know about that is if you and I tell them. It's not going to happen any other way. 
We frequently say, well, I make my witness by living my life. Well, that's great. The disciples were making their witness by living their lives out of faith as well that day. But people wanted to know what's going on. Somebody needs to tell me what's happening. And they did. They said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And so as we move through this week, how are you preparing to celebrate Easter? Folks, I don't think there's any better way to prepare than by listening to Jesus, doing what he tells you to do, having a broken heart for the lost of this world. And then when people ask you, what in the world is going on? You can tell them it's all about Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we do indeed thank you for this week, for the opportunity that you give us to travel with Jesus to the cross and to the resurrection. In his name we pray, amen. Would you join with me as we reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you pray with me? O oh God of all life, we know how it must have been for those people long ago who rejoiced when Jesus came to Jerusalem and cried out, Hosanna. We know how their hearts were filled with goodwill and how they happily threw palm branches before him. We know, too, when we look within how the goodwill faded as they shouted, crucify him. For, Lord, we, too, are capable of swinging from praise to denial, from singing to cursing. We're not always steady and sure of what we want in our loves and our loyalties. We can rejoice when it's time for rejoicing, sing when it's time for singing, and praise when it's time for praising. And we can be grateful that when we forget you and follow less worthy inclinations, you do not forget us. Oh, Lord, we wish you did not have to haul us back so often from our erring ways. But we are grateful that you do and that your love is as persistent as it is. Give us more of the flavor of your kind of love in our lives so that we can be more open to others, more creative and responsive to the beauty and the splendor that life can afford. Since you refuse to give up on us, help us to refuse to give up on ourselves. As we move toward the celebration of the great glad news of Easter, lift up our hearts, lift up our whole lives. This we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.